thanks heaps for coming on. I usually introduce this podcast to listeners. I call them my team, like I say, welcome team. But the, the reason I do that is because I try to treat listeners the same way I would like to treat you each day when we're at work, which is to expose them to wisdom or people or stories or whatever that may help them. So um, I try to, every time I talk to someone, I'm always thinking, how can this help the listener? So uh, thanks heaps. There's nothing scripted, no, no but uh, <coughs> I know I like starting like that because I know if I wanted to inspire a young kid, a young coach, a teacher, a, a business person, like whatever, there's so much about you that will make a massive difference. So please, when I'm saying I thank you, like you don't understand how much this helps people. So as an example, if there's a teacher now listening, that teacher then goes and influences 100 kids. That teacher's probably going to tell stories about when Nat Cleary was 12, you know, like. <laughs> so I know yeah. you don't think it, but it means a lot for me to have you on this nah, podcast. All good. Thanks for having me. Hopefully I can help a few people out. Awesome. Well, we might as well go straight there to being a 12-year-old or younger. Um, so we'll get a little bit of your background and then I'm sure this conversation will go in all directions. Yeah. Um, life as a young kid for you, what, what was that like? Where was it? Where did you grow up? What sports did you play? Yeah, so I originally grew up uh, on the northern beaches. Uh, Mum and dad are both out from out there. And then um, when I was about three, we moved over to New Zealand. Uh, dad finished his career over there playing, uh, moved back here for a year or two and then moved back to New Zealand um, when dad was coaching. So spent most of my childhood growing up in New Zealand. Um, really enjoyed it. It was, it was different, but um, I think it suited kind of, uh, I guess, my personality and I think the family really embraced it and liked it. Um, played soccer over there for a while, uh, probably till I was about 11 or 12. And, you know, I'd always enjoyed footy, but just for some reason just never really got into it and it was something that dad never really pushed me into or anything like that. So uh, I was enjoying my soccer and then uh, I got to a stage where I had a few mates that were playing league over there and I thought, um, you know, I was about, yeah, 11 or 12 and just wanted to, yeah, it was kind of just felt like I needed a bit more contact or something, just wanted to play footy and, yeah, got into that um, and, yeah, kind of, um, yeah, got back here when I was about 15, I think, so. Yeah, well, that's interesting if we stay there for a minute. You played soccer. Did you do any other sports? Yeah, I played uh, cricket, you know, um, played like touch footy, um, uh, yeah, just I liked all sports, all sports, but in terms of like playing on the weekends, it was probably only cricket, soccer, and then going to footy. But I'd kind of dabbled around with uh, like union, basketball, um, you know, anything that kind of had a ball in it, I was pretty keen to play. Okay, because that's that's interesting. You're now at the highest level, the highest level. And I, again, on this podcast, I try to bring people who are at the top of their game. You are at the top of your game, but I actually think it's only the beginning. Like yeah. your journey's got a long way to go. Yeah. Um, but again, if we think how can we help the listeners, there's a lot of parents now of young kids playing sport. Yeah. And you just gave me a little lesson from your own father who you said didn't push you into anything. Yeah. You played multiple sports, so there's a lesson straight away, a massive thing I'm a believer in is kids playing all sports. Yeah. Um, so even in that little story, there's, there's parents listening now going, hey, Maybe I shouldn't be so pushy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. let them play. Let yeah. them play. Because your skills are very – you've got a wider range of skills. You, uh, you can even play golf. You can, you, can, you can basketball, you can soccer, you can do all that. I, I see you love your soccer, by the way. You're wearing a Juventus jersey. What have we got here? Yeah, Juventus. Uh, Adidas sponsor um, most of the soccer team, so lucky enough to get a few jerseys. And pretty, um, support Man U, but pretty much Juventus as well, obviously, with Ronaldo and stuff like that. Yeah, nice. <coughs> Ronaldo. Now, I wonder if he's listening. Ronaldo, if you're listening, can you jump is. on the <laughs> – wouldn't love to have you on the podcast. I actually did meet Ronaldo. I went uh, – I'm a big believer in trying to learn off all sports, other sports, and I usually I make an effort to visit places around the world. Juventus has been one of them. And I loved when I asked one of their trainers, what does he bring to this team? And what he – the trainer explained it as – he lifts, like if your star player has a work ethic and the professionalism and all the things that make him world class, I'm not talking good, I mean world class, it lifts 
everyone else up. So he just apparently just changed the dressing room feel. Um, he wears the number seven, so do you. You have – he's in his 30s, mid-30s. You have that role at your club at 23. Yeah. Do you understand <clears throat> how big that role is to – like he sets the standards at his club to be world class. Do you understand what's on your shoulders? Yeah, I think so. I think um, you know, it kind of comes with responsibility of, um, I guess, wearing the number seven jersey in the first place. Obviously, everyone kind of looks to you on the field to to be the man to direct them around. But now that um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be co-captain alongside Yoey, it's you know, you got to be setting example 24/7. Now it's not just here and there. It's um, whenever you come into training, off the field, on the field, um, yeah, you got to be, um, you know, doing the right thing, and hopefully that influences the younger guys. Okay, we're we're going to go back there definitely, but you mentioned you mentioned the word influence there, so I'm actually going to ask you who influenced you, a couple of people you look up to in your life, and what characteristics have influenced you. You've already mentioned your mum and dad couple of times and we've only been talking mm. five minutes so can we start there yeah sure family? I think um you know I'm very lucky with the family I have uh you know we're, we're a pretty close family um everyone gets along and I think mum and dad have provided you know they've got four kids but they provided us with everything we needed to to kind of have a go at life and they've always been super supportive no matter what's happened and yeah I can't thank mum and mum and dad enough I think they're definitely two of my role models um Mum more so, she's just probably the most caring person I know. She's always so helpful with everyone. And uh, I think that's a real good character trait to have. Um, and saying that, you know, I, li- I like to, to try emulate. It's pretty hard to try and help everyone have a conversation with everyone, but mum seems to do that all the time. And, you know, I think dad's just super hardworking and he's, he's really loyal as well. Um, it's another, you know, character trait I like is just being loyal, um, you know, always kind of protecting your own, supporting your own um, no matter and it's no different um, playing in this team now. Definitely like to have that um, character trait. Uh, so, yeah, them two are definitely two people I look up to and they've had a massive influence on my life. Mate, can I, can I just say, first of all, how I love listening to that, but also I don't know if you realise that that comes out in you and your game. Now, what you said about your mum, as she gets around... She can talk, she can care about others and whatever. That's, I see you do that as a number seven. Like that's your big big job as a number seven is build relationships and make an effort. And I, I see you every day get around this building and go and shake everyone's hand basically, um, yeah. connect with everyone. You've had to work on that, I've noticed. I've seen you develop that. You made a decision, that's what you're going to do. Mm. To work on that? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, <laughs> different to mum, it probably doesn't come naturally to me in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, right. a bit introverted, a bit shy where she's totally out there and happy to have a conversation with anyone. But, you know, I knew that was important um, within the team to build relationships and, you know, connect with people because, um, you know, ultimately that's what builds trust. So I think one thing I tried to do to work on that was just um, every time I came into training, each morning was just go around and, you know, just greet everyone that was in the shed. Um, you know, I think that helps just, you know, let them know that, um, you know, just build a connection and, uh, yeah, I think it's definitely helped. Awesome. And you mentioned loyalty and characteristics from your father there and, and your dad's very calm too. You, I see that a lot in you, yeah. um, which obviously is how you've been brought up. You're very, very calm, um, very ultra competitive where was that influence in your upbringing like you you're very calm but you compete hard yeah. <laughs> at everything what talk is, is there a little influence there growing up yeah I'm not too sure um about influence I think it probably comes from dad as well I think he was definitely competitive but I think it's just in terms of characteristics I'm probably a lot more like dad where he's probably he's probably a bit shy introverted but super competitive and I think I've got a lot of his characteristics um but yeah, you don't have to ask dad about the um, competitive gr- competitiveness growing up. Like I used to versus just play footy with him in the front yard when I was like four, five, six years old and I'd cry if I didn't win. Like it was just it's pretty embarrassing telling it now. But <laughs> I think it, it definitely stemmed from a young age and, um, you know, I think it's just, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. It's anything I play, I just yeah, want to try to win. 
That's awesome. And so on the rest of the family, I mean, you have your sport that you're now at the top of your game at. You have a lot of that on both sides of the family, right? Yeah. um, It's probably more so on mum's side, actually. So a lot of people think that the footy kind of... Uh, ability comes from dad's side but it's probably more so mum um, she's been surrounded by footy her whole life uh, her dad played uh, a couple of NRL games I think and then her brother's brother played NRL and then uh, her brother-in-law also played NRL so there's a few on on that side but then there's also dad and you know both his brothers were were sporty and um, ultra competitive as well but they probably weren't so much into footy. Okay you even went to grandparents there um You've you've told me before your hero is your grandfather. Yeah. Um, any characteristics about him that you can feel living and firing within you? Yeah, I think um, you know I think the what the best thing about him was just how how well respected he was. Um, you know, no one ever had a bad word to say about him. He was actually a, he was a bookie down at um, Randwick and and around there. And even even when I go there now, like to the races, there's bookies coming up to me like Thank talking you. about him, saying like how much of a legend he was and. Yeah, I think that's saying that that's um, – I definitely want to be like when I'm older is just people that just have this, you know, profound respect for you no matter who they are. Um, and he just – yeah, he had time of day for everyone and that's something that, yeah, definitely loved about him. And he was he was super caring too. He's, he's very much like mum. That's awesome. I, I, um, I love you use the word respect. I actually see everything you do, I see respect. So when I see you work so hard – I see you respecting the game and the game is paying you back. Yeah. You know, I see your teammates, you respect them that much and they, they are that loyal to you, they love you for it. Uh, I see you respect fans and they love you for it. Like, um, but again, re- even relating that back to your granddad, I think it's so, you, you will finish this game like that and you will be like that. There's no doubt you already are. That's authentic, it comes out of you, it's not fake. So. Um, but that's cool and I love listening to you when you talk about your family like that because um, it's special. You know, I see you when you run out on the field, you still look up to the sky for your granddad and yeah, that. And, yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I reckon from 12 years old, you, you've given some real lessons there. And one is those people are such big influences on your life. Was there any junior coaches, any junior, other people in and amongst family or is there anyone you really looked up to or followed or did you study certain players? What yeah. else has um, been a big part of your development? In terms of like footy players, I probably, as I said, you know, I was watching footy since I was, for as long as I could remember, like I was always loving footy, watched it. Um, obviously Joey growing up, you know, loved watching him and then um, in terms of probably study, that didn't come to a bit later on, you know, when you get in a system like this where you can just jump on the computer and, and look people up. Like when I first kind of discovered that, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So I was, you know, looking up Cooper Cronk, Jonathan Thurston. They were probably two main ones that I kind of, I guess, watched their game closely. Um, you know, we're pretty lucky with the analyzer stuff we've got. You just, yeah, type it in and you can watch all their kicks, all their runs, all the try assist, stuff like that. So they were probably two people that... Um, you know, I watched and, and I guess, um, you know, I think I'm definitely different to them but just try to, um, you know, implement a few things that they did well um, and were successful in and try to implement that in my game. Okay, you mentioned there how much you study the game. So for the listeners, I'll try to paint a picture here. I, I walk past a room where there's computers set up where players can go in and study vision. I see Nathan in there before training. I see, I see you there after training. And this is no exaggeration to the listeners. I know you know I'm telling the truth, but the people listening, I left the building about 9 p.m. a week ago and you were still in the room studying vision. I don't think anyone studies vision as much as you. I'm, I know you have to in your position, you, but what is it like? Like, I can't, I don't know if I can paint the picture well enough for everyone to say, like, you are first on the field, you are last to leave the field. If we introduce something from our sports nutritionist, you're the one going to follow it up one-on-one. If we talk to you about sleeping, you're the one going investing in a better room to sleep in. If we talk, if we talk about anything, you're the one following it up. Like, you're always trying to get better. 
But this studying of vision, it's honestly, it's the type of stuff that I will tell stories about forever to any young kid is the best in the world are students of their sport. There's no better student than you, but what is it? Like you just said you've been doing this since you were a kid, but you just used to watch footy yeah. naturally and now you deliberately watch it. But talk well, me through this. I think that's part of it. Like I just, you know, I don't feel like it's a chore or I don't really feel like it's forced either. Like I just, you know, I, I quite enjoy just watching footy. Um, you know, there's probably people that play footy that, you know, there's, um, they try to stay away from it just to clear their head. But, you know, I think I just, yeah, I really enjoy watching footy and um, – actually makes me feel, I guess, calmer when I actually watch other games and stuff like that. So in terms of study, I just think it comes back to um, preparation. You know, I feel like I just want to go into the game as prepared as I can be so then, you know, you don't have any excuses if you don't play well or anything like that. And, you know, I think study is just a part of that. Um, and, you know, we're super lucky with, I guess, the setup we've got. Like you can jump on the computer after training, watch the whole training session, then you can go on the analyzer and then watch any game from however long ago you want so it's pretty cool to do that and um you know it's just something i try to do uh each week just try to watch each training session where to get better where to improve what's working what's not and then um probably watch the, the opposition and um you know just try to tinker around with that and you know see what we can do well does it spin you out to know that kids are now watching you to study you does yeah. it do you realize that <laughs> They might not have the software programs, but they're, they're YouTubing, Instagramming, even like I love listening ones. Kobe Bryant used to study pictures, mm. still shots, yeah. to see little fundamental techniques and body positions and angles. And um, Do you realise that's happening? Yeah, it's, um, it's, pr it's still spinning out. Like it's, it's very humbling. Um, you, know, you get people kind of messaging you saying, um, you know, you're my idol, stuff like that. Like it's, yeah, it's still crazy and um you know something that I definitely don't take for granted like it just it doesn't even feel like that long ago that I was that guy and uh, it was actually funny last year we versed the Broncos and the uh that Tom did and he's a young halfback up there and he kind of said to me after the game he was like oh I've been like watching you and and you're kicking and stuff like that, trying to you know um help that with my game and I was just like yeah it was crazy I was like yeah it was actually really like just a humbling experience because yeah, it's still kind of within myself. It still feels like I'm still learning so much more and, you know, still got such a long way to go and I'm still, um, you know, studying other players to get better. But to have people say that to you, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. What was that like for you when you first come up against the people you were studying and your idols as such? What was that like? Like you grew up uh, in New Zealand and so you probably grew up following Sean Johnson. Yeah. Um, when you first played against him, what was that like? Yeah, that was like crazy. I remember, um, obviously, I was I was pretty lucky with um, dad coaching the Warriors. Like, I got to meet a lot of the players, and um, you know, I was always in awe of like Shawnee Johnson. He's just some of the stuff he could do. Like, I'd never be able to be like him. So he's a hard person to study because some of the stuff he did on the field, I'd never be able to do. But um, you know, I just loved the way he played the game. And then obviously, got to first him for the first time, and it was. Um, yeah, it's just – it's hard to explain, like, just lining up against them. You're like, you know, I've watched this guy growing up and now he's – I have to tackle him, I have to try to defend him and, and stop, you know, the magic he does. And, um, you know, it's pretty crazy, but it's also, um, you know, it's a really cool feeling. And, you know, I was lucky enough as well in, in my debut was against um, Cooper Cronk and Sam, Cameron Smith in down in Melbourne. Yeah, so that was like – that was a massive spin out because I was like, well, wow, this is like – How did you go? Oh, we got smashed. I think it, they made me make like 40, 45 tackles saying that game. But um, yeah, it was like, just, yeah, it was just, it was just a blur really. Like I just couldn't believe it even happened. I still have to pinch myself um, that I was able to even play an NRL game, but let alone against those guys. Like it was pretty crazy. How old were you when you made your debut? I was 18. Okay. Yeah, so that kind of just, it kind of came out of nowhere as well. Like um, I remember the year before that, me and dad were kind of speaking and um, – I'd just signed a new contract to join the first grade squad in 2018 and I think I would have been about 20 then, 20, 21. And, um, you know, Dad was like, you know, that's a real good opportunity for you to have a crack, you know, push for that first grade spot. And then, um, yeah, and then Dad ended up uh, getting the sack, so he left. And then that that year was just – the next year was um, 2016 and it all happened so fast. I think I played 10, 20 games, um, played one – New Wales Cup game and then um, 
hook called me into his office and I was like, I didn't really know what was going on, but I just felt instant nerves. And then he's like, oh, you know, I'm going to give you a game this week. And I was just, yeah, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And, um, you know, lucky enough, haven't looked back since. Okay, so we, we've covered a little bit the story is of, of a young Nathan Cleary. We've jumped a few years to an 18-year-old making his debut. Um, you mentioned in there what it's like now getting messages from fans because I want to go off in that direction for a second. With the pressure of coming in as a halfback, I think I first met you when you were 18 and I think – did you play City Origin at 18? No, I think it was 19, 19, 19, yeah. 19. 19. So I think I first met you at 19 and what I've seen in four years in your growth is, is – I can't even describe it in this podcast. But with that comes a lot of pressure – and you mentioned you get nice messages, but I'll, let's just change the topic to the absolute shit you have to put up with sometimes. Yeah. Um, because, again, I'm, I'm always thinking how can I help listeners? There's parents that are going to have kids come home from school have been bullied on their phones. Mm. There's young kids with a lot of pressure, sporting pressure, that read something on socials and lock themselves in their room. Yeah. You're human as well. Just because you you look bulletproof on a field, you're not. Tell me about some of the shit you have to cop or have copped and yeah. lessons you've learned. Let's go there. Yeah, well... Um, I didn't so plan on going here, but let's go there. <laughs> so early on in my career, um, I was probably pretty lucky. Like I was... We were going all right. Like we are winning games and, you know, I was kind of just, you know, the young kid on the block. So um, I guess you'd kind of get away with a few bad games and stuff like that. Um, but the first kind of time I got message was that that debut year. So I was still 18. We lost to Canberra in the semi. Uh, I was like on the bus home and just got this message pop up. And like I was still young, so I just read everything that I got. And uh, it was like, <laughs> it was like, oh, um, you f come down to Penrith Station. Like there's a few guys that want to see you and stuff like that. So I was like, I had, I ca- yeah, I. I kind of knew that was part of the gig, like just kind of laughed about it and then, um, and then yeah, just kind of got on with it. But then um, I guess when you well, – I think it was as soon as I started playing State of Origin, like the I guess the perception of your changes, like you have to be playing well every week, which is, you know, fair enough. And um, I just, yeah, I just probably wasn't prepared, mentally prepared for that. Um, that next year, I think it was 2019, um, you know, I was in pretty bad form. I wasn't playing well at the start of the year and, you know, I just, uh, yeah, I was just reading pretty much everything I got and, it, yeah, it just kind of um, took over my mental state and was it affecting the way I was playing and, you know, it was probably the most frustrating thing was, you know, I was reading all this stuff and it was just just paralysing me and, um, you know, it was just, yeah, and then it was just affecting the way I played which affected the team which probably hurt me the most. Um, you know, I just wasn't in the, the right state to perform well and, you know, that's something that I had to, had to learn and, you know, I think it was when we had a chat about it. Um, we just had to, I guess it was the first time I'd acknowledged that, um, you know, I probably had just like performance anxiety just from, um, you know, reading all this stuff and just putting, I guess, extra pressure on myself to, to you know, um, which at the end of the day, like footy is a tough enough game as it is and there's a lot of pressure in it in itself. So if you put in more um, unneeded pressure, I guess, just from what people on Twitter or people have messaged you on Instagram or stuff like that, like it just yeah, it makes it so much harder. You know what? Out of all the stories we've been telling, this this could be a crucial part of this chat yeah. to help people. Uh, you mentioned when we had a chat about it and and my memories of that were the week I, I could see what was going on and, in fact, a week or two earlier before we did have – sit down and try to get on top of all this was I thought I'm going to pretend I'm one of the players and I'm just going to go and read all the comments and I read the comments honestly mate like like I get some but I'm a bit older and probably it was easier for me to brush people but I actually I said I'm going to put myself in the shoes I'm going to read all the comments and then I even went to some other losing teams of different sports that week and read all the comments and some of the messages were like brutal like some of them were threatening some of them were and I picture myself I'm a young 
21 year old reading this stuff like what would it be like and then anyway we had that chat and yeah it, the biggest thing was acknowledging it right mm, yeah. and acknowledging that it was causing some anxiety um, because it, what you were doing was then worrying about everything else yeah. but little did you know over here you had people in your corner backing yeah, you like yeah. Brad Fittler was always picking you as his halfback yeah he never wavered on what he values in you and your game and his senior players never wavered. They wanted you as their halfback. But you didn't know all that. <laughs> You're just reading all this stuff over here. Yeah. Um, and that's a real lesson. We, we acknowledge the term FOPO, which, which I I'd, I'd got from Dr Michael Gervais yeah. and Pete Carroll and we... we I wrote that on my board and explained it to you what FOPO was, fear of other people's opinions. Yeah. And it can be paralysing but it was really happening to you. It was paralysing, right? Yeah. It was yeah. paralysing. Yeah, it was, that's what I mean. Like it, was, yeah, it became uh, even more frustrating because I, I was kind of realising that it was um, definitely affecting me. Um, and then, yeah, it was just, it was just, yeah, it was just an- <laughs> I guess it was just annoying that I'd let myself get to this state where I was letting random people affect the way I was I was going about myself and it was making, you know, I wasn't even making footy, like I wasn't even enjoying it because I was so worried about, you know, what was going to happen or if I was going to make mistakes or not play well and, you know, it was just, yeah, it was just a bad headspace to be in. And, but I guess it was the first time I'd kind of experienced it fully. Um, you know, it was probably the first time I'd been in a real bad patch of form and, um, yeah, and then you just realise that, you know, people can be um, really negative and, and super ruthless out there. So, um, But in saying that, I'm glad it kind of happened at a young age so that I could, you know, put in techniques, I guess, to deal with it. And um, I think it's definitely helped me um, for the future. I just – honestly, mate, you've even just said you've put in techniques to help that because you knew you needed to grow in that area mentally. You put techniques into your craft every day that you know you need to grow into. You put lessons into your study – that you want to study the game, like everything you do is to continually getting better on this journey. Yeah. Where's it going to – where Where do you see this journey going? Like I see you always getting better but what is really fueling you? Like where do you want to get to? Oh, I think um, Dad always says it. He says, you know, it's, it's not a destination and, you know, that's the way I see it is, you know, I don't, I don't really see an end point. I just see, you know, opportunities each day to get better and, um, at the moment, that's that's what I'm kind of focused on. Um, you know, I think obviously you just want to get the best out of yourself. At the end of the day, you want to you know finish your career and look back and say, you know, did I give myself every opportunity to to be the best, the best version of myself? And um, you know, I think a driving factor for me is just yeah, I just want to get better. And I, I know there's a lot of room for improvement. And you know, I don't think I'm ever comfortable with where I'm at. So. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, we still haven't won a comp or anything like that. So uh, that's definitely a driving factor. I'd love to be able to bring a, um, you know, premiership to Penrith. That's probably my number one goal. And um, But, yeah, along with that, just want to, yeah, be the best version of myself at the end of the day and um, try to get the most out of me. Awesome. You, I, I just love that we've acknowledged that to be the best at this game, you even have to work on the mental side. You even have to work on how to acknowledge dealing with shit messages. Like there's so much to this profession yeah. that people wouldn't understand that. Yeah. Do you know I even had a funny chat with Wayne Bennett about that moment we had in our yeah. office and he's like, what do you mean? And I, I said, well, Wayne, you, at that time when Nathan's reading shit and reading messages and worried, I said, even you come out with shit. Even you were saying that you wouldn't pick him as the New South Wales halfback. You wanted Adam Reynolds and Cody Walker as your halves. And and I said, I know you, Wayne. And I'm saying this with all respect yeah. to Wayne. I love yeah. him. Yeah. But I said, I know you. You don't care about New South Wales. First of all, you're a Queenslander. <laughs> and he, he laughs and smirks. <laughs> and I said, and also, by backing your South players, they love you even more and want to play for you even more at South. Yeah. Like, you don't give a rats about Nathan Cleary or you don't care about uh, New South Wales. And he laughed and he said, oh, you got me, you got me. <laughs> but that was good that day for me to tell you, look, this doesn't matter. Yeah, like yeah. the people who've got your back, so you you tightened up your circles, I feel, and you've started to not even care what experts say. Yeah. You know, you really, 
you've tightened that up, haven't you? Yeah. Well, I think that's probably been the biggest thing for me is just, um, you know, I guess prioritising who I listen to and whose opinions mean something to me. And, you know, that was, that was I think that was the easy thing to do. Um, and it was probably annoying that I hadn't done it earlier. And, uh, you know, it's the, I think it's the obvious thing to do as well. Like, for example, in, in this kind of space, like I'd listen to my teammates, listen to the coaching staff, listen to my family, my close friends. And, you know, if they're telling me something that I need to get better at or, or I'm not doing well, then 100% I'm, I'm all for that. Like it's, I don't think it's a, it's a fair of um, criticism. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to learn and get better. And, you know, if it's coming from people like that, then, you know, I'm always going to listen. But if it's coming from someone on Twitter with no profile picture or, um, you know, something like that, that's just spraying you. Like what, <laughs> why would I listen to that over, you know, all right. the great minds I have um, help me and you know it's something I definitely learned and um, you know, I'm, yeah I'm very very glad that it's come to that. Mate you just reminded me the, the no profile picture <laughs> I got one so you had a ridiculously good year last year won however many games in a row playing for your state even when even when the critics come out about Origin 1 Freddie then says I'll back you even more you're now the vice captain of this team this is your team and you played the best game ever, game two. When after game three, I have this bloke on Instagram message me, f- no picture, fake name, <laughs> blaming me, said, you're the reason why Nathan Cleary, blah, blah, blah. Um, I shouldn't have bitten back. Like I tell you blokes <laughs> and I'll buy back, but I have a bit of fun. I write, mate, give me a real name at least so yeah. I know who I'm talking to. Mate, he started telling me, Got pretty personal. He told me to go and catch COVID and mm-hmm. die basically. Yeah. Um, he he <laughs> he ended up getting really weird and like he told me I he he said go to a podcast on losing or something like that and I went oh okay so at least I've got a listener and <laughs> you know and he writes back then it starts like yeah I'm I'm masturbating over your voice right now on your podcast and I was like whoa <laughs> whoa 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 it gets a bit weird like he's gone from He's gone from telling me I'm a loser yeah. and I help you lose. He didn't message me when you win. He just messaged me when we lose. <laughs> anyway, um, but then it got all weird and like, and I was thinking, these people are out there like, I'm older, I feel like I can handle it, but what if that's coming at your 15-year-old kid? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like it's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. I just wish there was a way you could mm. identify a fake name and expose yeah. them to the world. Yeah, you know, yeah, like some of the ones you've got. Like you must have had some bad ones. People threatening to. Yeah, well, you know? yeah. There's there's definitely some <laughs> pretty tough people out there. Like especially once um you know dad came over and you know just got like a bit personal with family and stuff like that. But yeah, right. You know, at the end of the day, I don't. Yeah, I don't think people kind of understand that if you know if you're not. You know, if you're not prepared or like you don't understand what's going on, like it can definitely have a, a pretty big, um, pretty big effect on like your mental health and stuff like that. So um, I understand like fans are passionate and stuff like that, but you know I think there's a line sometimes, and you know I just think, I think there's people out there, out there that probably don't understand that, and you know I think that's something that you've got to understand as, as a player and stuff like that is you know um, there's just some things that you got to deal with. Uh, you know it's, it's definitely not the right thing to do, but. At the end of the day, you just got to try try ignore it the best you can, and um, it's easier said than done. But I think if you're prioritising who you listen to, um, it definitely helps. And you know, I see, I you know, I still get messages now, but it's just kind of, um, you know, you see a couple of them, it's just like, oh, you know, whatever. Like I don't, I don't even care what, it, what you're saying. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Okay, I'm gonna. I could talk to you all day. We've definitely shared some insight, and I know it's going to help people. Um, but your love for the game, you've mentioned a couple of times. Mm. Your love, you mentioned as a kid, like it's never been a chore, just love it. Okay. So I want to ask you, we always talk about never lose the 12-year-old. Well, that was a line I used to try to use yeah. and then I think I must have stolen it because then we watched a doco once on Wayne, Gret- <laughs> Wayne Gretzky <laughs> and he said never lose the nine-year-old. Yeah, yeah. So how are we ever going to never lose the nine-year-old in you or the 12-year-old? Because yeah. you started playing footy at 12. Yeah, yeah. Um, because what comes with it, as we know, pressure, expectations, a lot of money, a lot of this, a lot of that. But you play your best when you're having fun. You play your best when you're clear-minded. Yeah. Yeah. How are we, how are we going to keep that? Because you're only 23. Yeah. You've got a long time yeah. to go. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, I probably had a taste of, of losing the nine-year-old in me, I guess. Um, you know, when I was worrying too much about what other people were saying, I wasn't I wasn't even, you know, enjoying or, or allowing myself to enjoy actually playing footy, which is, you know, it's it's the main reason I'm here today was the just my love for footy and, you know, I always grew up watching it, always loved it, um, started playing because I enjoyed it so much. So, um, you know, there's always going to be added pressures and, and stuff like that, but... You know, that's saying that that's going to be there. You can't, you know, it's, it's external stuff. You can't change the fact that there's always going to be pressure and stuff like that. But you can you can definitely control um, the way you go about it and, and how you can enjoy it and stuff like that. And I think, you know, you mentioned being being clear and, you know, that's something that comes back to preparation, which is why I value it so much. I know if, you know, I've ticked the boxes and, and I feel like I've got my preparation right that once it comes to game day, I'm... It's it's just playing the game, like it's just having fun. It's it's enjoying it and um, enjoying the challenge that it possesses as well. And you know, I think sometimes um, you could probably fall into a trap if you're not prepared well enough. Then you get to game day and you're worried, and it allows you to have excuses about you know why you might not perform that day. But you know, I think if you if you can tick every box, um, then once you get to game day, it's yeah, it's just the game to play. No matter how much pressure, how much people are talking. Um, no matter what stage stage it's at, um, you know it's just yeah, it's just a game, and you know you got to enjoy it. I'm very lucky with the, I guess the team and and the culture we've built around here that, um, you know everyone works super hard. Like I don't think I've been a part of a team that that works so hard for each other or trains so hard. But I've also never been a part of a team that has so much fun with it and there's so much banter and just, you know I guess sometimes just kind of blase about what's going on and the pressures around it, which which makes it easy and it makes it enjoyable and fun and. I think that's probably um, another thing that you talk about, like where's the the final point. It's um, you know I always see uh, you know I want to be that kind of person that that brings brings um, their teammates up and you know allows their teammates to feel their p- potential as well. And I think the environment and culture in now definitely does that, and it's yeah it's very enjoyable to be a part of, and I think it's definitely helped with um, me kind of getting to uh, my best form. Um, and also the rest of the team as well. Super impressive the way you have everything in order right now. Your answer to that is so impressive. I don't know if you understand at your age. Like it feels like I'm talking to a 33-year-old, <laughs> not a 23-year-old. But in there you mentioned mateship, you yeah. mentioned the fun and I see it in you. And you once said to me, your vision is to play with a group of best mates. Yeah. That fight to the death was mm. what you said to me yeah. once. But the best mates bit, it's genuine. Like you can't fake it. Yeah. You can't fake it. Mm. Like, And even you just said there, like you want to bring others up and get them to enjoy it and whatever. Yeah. Like you can't fake that. That is such a trait of a leader. That's why you're the captain of this team because you genuinely care about creating that for others and you care for your mates. Uh, how good is sport for mateship? Like, again, there's parents listening, teachers listening. Throw your kids in team sport, yeah, no man. matter what the sport. Like, you got memories for life, right? Yeah, Mates 100%. for life. And, you know, I guess that's another reason why we're kind of lucky is that a lot of us in the team now have kind of played um, through the juniors together. And now that we've kind of reached this, like, it was it was a dream back then to be able to play NRL, but to be able to do it together now and and, you know, just to win one game with them was, was awesome but especially in the streak last year it was it was, yeah, it was it's hard to explain how good it was and um, you know and then unfortunately we, we lost the big one but you know if we could um, win a comp together it would be yeah it would definitely be a dream come true and at the end of the day there's nothing better than after a game um, you know getting a win with you know your best, best mates. mates like it's yeah, good. <laughs> it's the best i like, tell you what we'll finish because um, you have to go training yeah, yeah. Um We'll finish on a little bit of a, a Man United. You said you love Man United. There's a great doco, class of 92, all these great mates that grew up together. I think seven of them maybe. Yeah. It's, it, it's very similar to what you have here. You have this group of best mates that have grown up together. Um, and I just, I just love seeing what's happening. And I'll finish with a bit of Alex Ferguson. Alex Ferguson's pr- pretty famous for a time. He, he mentioned that. The terminology world class is way overused. People use that word all the time. He only sees Ronaldo and Messi as world class. 
he sees a lot of other good players, but world class. There's characteristics of being world class. Uh, people that are listening can go and listen to that. Just search Alex Ferguson description of world class. You are on your way there, mate. You're on your way there. People would say you are now, but I know you are still determined to go. There's a few more things you need to tick off. But you're on your way there, mate, and it's such a pleasure to be able to share that to the listeners. And and for me personally, I love working every day with you. I love it. Um, um, but to share that with others is awesome. No, I appreciate that, mate. Thank you for the kind words. And, um, you know, again, I think I've got a lot of people to thank for, um, you know, who I am today and no more so than teammates and coaching staff. Like, it would be nothing without you guys. So. Good, man. Thanks, mate. Cheers.